Welcome back to Honesty Talk. In this episode of Honesty Talk, we have a wonderful guest with us, a dear friend, Naima B. Robert, mashallah, who is known famously for a beautiful book that she wrote nearly 15 years ago called From My Sister's Lips. She's an author, a speaker, a coach, and she's really going to bring it to Honesty Talk. So, First of all, Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much for taking part in this episode. Um, I would like to start this episode by taking you back to 15 years ago Mm -hmm. when you wrote From My Sister's Lips. You were living in a certain community. You were around a group of sisters and you did something that was quite extraordinary back then. You were, you had a goal, you had a dream. And you did it. Um, And I'd like to talk about the reaction of the community towards you writing and publishing from my sister's lips. Assalamu alaikum. Well, I'm totally fangirling right now, so that's good. Um, But, you know, to your question, um, Alia, the interesting thing about from my sister's lips was it came from a place inside me that predates Islam, Mm -hmm. even though it was about my journey of becoming Muslim and like, you know, it's really kind of taking the reader into the hidden world, really, that's what it was at the time, a hidden world of these women who had actually chosen Islam and were happy to be Muslim. Mm -hmm. So although it was a very Muslim story in that sense, I think the very fact that I wrote it basically came from before Islam because I grew up with people just believing that I could do something amazing. My dad was one of them. I had several teachers at school. I was given a lot of opportunities at school Mm -hmm. to excel and just do amazing stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So alhamdulillah, like when I was presented with that opportunity to to, to be able to tell my story, our story, it was something that I pulled from my past, that I pulled from my roots, from who I was, not as a wife or as a mum or as a Muslimah, or as someone who wore niqab, or was in a particular community, it came from somewhere completely different. And that's why it was such a, like, ajeeb. Mm-hmm. Like, how, how does that fit with where we live? You know, how Muslim women are expected to be. Even the opportunity to do something like that yeah. was so out of, out of the, 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 the sphere of possibility, really, mm-hmm. for us at that time in the UK, in South London, in the community that we were in. So, and because it was mainstream. It, that's what yes, I'm saying. Well. It, was mainstream. Yes. it wasn't just a book that came out. There were the TV but... interviews. Yeah. There was, yes. It was, it was a, like, you know when they say, like, you're in the comfort zone and you go into the stretch zone? Mm. This was pure stretch zone for me, for my husband, and for everyone around us because people almost didn't know how to respond. What do we do? <laughs> how do we treat her now? How, how, did, how did specifically the Muslim women within the community respond to you doing this back then? I think there was a lot of fear because at that time, you know, it was very black and white in those days. Mm. Yeah. Either committed to Dean or you were in the dunya. Right. right. No gray in between. There was no gray. Mm-hmm. And if you committed to Dean, you gave up the dunya, you know, and you committed to the Muslim community, you gave up mainstream approval. That's it. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you the lines were very, very firmly drawn in the sand. So it was like an oxymoron. What do you mean a woman in niqab on Good Morning TV? Like, what do you mean? You know, what do you mean a, a sister, you know, with jilbab, you know, which is what I used to wear then in jilbab, full niqab and everything, signing a deal with Random House, like going on, on BBC Radio 4 to talk, you know, with what's her name? That one, Elizabeth, I can't even remember her name now, Melanie, mm. to talk about morality and all this kind of thing. It was like, it was weird. Mm. So the fear was you're going to lose your dean. Wow. That, that's what it was. You've exposed yourself. You have, yeah, you've exposed yourself. You've exposed yourself as a woman. You've exposed your family. I remember a friend saying to me, like, you know, don't you feel bad for your husband? Wow. Because I mentioned him at the beginning of the book and I talked about a part of our story of how we got married. And obviously it was a conversation she must have had with her husband about like, like I would not feel comfortable with that. Right. So, so it was this fear that you've exposed yourself. Now you're going to get it. Mm. You will be blamed. You will be judged. You will be humiliated. You will be humiliated, actually. And I remember that the sisters who worked with me on the book, 
were very cautious mm -hmm. to support it. Mm -hmm. Because on the one hand, they had been involved and they, they loved me as a person. But on the other hand, it was like, what is going to happen as a result? Community. What, what is going say? to happen? Mm. And the interesting thing was <laughs> the people that were most supportive actually were the brothers who were in the mainstream. How interesting. So brothers who were in the community in that same bubble. No. no. Mm. Yeah. No, no, no. Not at all. But brothers who were out there working in local government or working in Dawa or just out in the mainstream, they could see the value of it. Must have been refreshing. Well, for them, I, to be honest, <laughs> I, I, I sometimes think that they, I kind of became a poster girl mm. because it's like, you see? Our women. Our women. Yeah. No, B, I'm not one of your women. Yeah. And none yeah. of your women did that. Okay. And there's a reason for that. I'm not your woman. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 because I, I got it on the one hand and I appreciated their support. Yeah. But on the other hand, I just thought this is disingenuous. Mm. I am not representative of the women in our community, and you full well know that. Yeah. This is something gharib for our yeah, community. Strange, and not strange. only is it strange, but if you ask a lot of the sisters, they're conflicted about it, yeah. you know? So subhanAllah, it really is a case of sometimes you have to not be liked in the short term in order to, in order to deserve love in the long term. Yeah. And I think at the time, if I had cared about or paid attention to what people around me were, were, were saying or were thinking or were feeling and all the stories that went around the little conspiracies and stuff like that. And if I had, you know, kind of capitulated in order to make them feel comfortable, we would have lost such a khair because that book has been the, basically a source of guidance and solace for literally thousands and thousands and thousands of women all over the world, subhanAllah. So sometimes you have to just, you know, you have to, uh, I guess, you know, ruffle a few feathers, right? Okay, so like moving forward now, that was about 15 years ago. Yeah. So I want us to really have a very honest and open conversation about sisters and how they are with each other, particularly how they are with sisters who are doing well. I mean, we spoke about this um, briefly. Um, but I really want us to talk about the importance of women supporting each other, sisters supporting each other, women raising each other up. Yeah. Um, so things have obviously moved. They've progressed from back then. And we find that more and more sisters are out there. They're doing things. They're achieving. They're, 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 just, they're really just living it. They're living the life, mashallah. Um, why is it important for women to support other women, to love on other women? I think because surprisingly enough, even though people like to tell the story that society or men are giving us flack in a hard time, a lot of times whenever there's pushback or judgment or you know, someone getting on your case about what you're trying to do, a lot of times it's other women, mm -hmm. it's other sisters who are the most kind of... Uh, vocal in, in opposing or criticizing. So I think that getting on board and really being support for each other is, is important. And we've seen that honesty talk, right? Yeah. That the, the, those that were most supportive, I mean, were brothers actually, and the most flack that we've received have been from women. That's really interesting, right? I think a lot of it comes from projection, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and maybe you guys have spoken about this, but I think that, like you said, sometimes it literally is. And in fact, most of the time, I just believe that that person has their own issues yeah. that they do not want to resolve. Yeah. And that's... Or they're not, they're not aware of even. True, true. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that most people are capable of having an honest conversation with themselves yes. if they choose to. If they choose to. Right? Yeah. But it's much easier to project onto someone else yes. and project whatever nonsense you've got going on inside you. Mm -hmm. Put that on somebody else to say, you're to this, you're to that. You know, why are you, you know, doing this? Why are you doing that? You shouldn't be doing this, shouldn't be doing that. A lot of the time it's because she wants to do it and she can't. Mm -hmm. Or she dreamt of doing it, but she has been prevented from doing it. Or like she had that dream all the time, but she feels like she's wasted her life and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the time, 
Anyway, I always, whenever there is a situation, because I remember uh, around the time of, 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 you know, after the book came out, I mean, it, it lasted for a long time, the, the hype. But one of the things I realized about haters is one, they very rarely have anything to say for themselves. So most of the time, haters are not people who they themselves are doing something wow. and they disagree with what you're doing. Right. Haters usually are not doing anything at all. Yes. Because I'm not doing anything. You shouldn't be doing anything. Exactly. Exactly. So, so haters, firstly, they don't, they're usually not doing anything themselves. And secondly, they are in a situation where basically they are looking at what you're doing, right? Most of the time, they don't even understand what you're doing. Okay. They, they haven't looked into it. I remember there was a situation. Uh, I went on Good Morning TV. And the word got out that I had been on Loose Women. So I had a very close friend of mine call me and say, I heard you were on that really bad TV show, Loose Women. Bear in mind, this is the 90s. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so things have changed a bit since then. Yes. But she said, I heard you were on this really bad show, Loose Women. So I was like, well, I wasn't on the show, Loose Women. She said, oh, but the sister said that she's, she's sure she saw you on Loose Women. Wow. And this is like, you know, another sister I remember, she came and she said, um, you know, that trailer for your new book, Does it have music in it? And I was like, no, it doesn't. She was like, but it really sounds like music. And then another one said, you know, about the book, you know, like I heard that it's promoting haram relationships between men and women, between boys and girls, and it's a big fit in the community. I said, have you read the book? She said, no. So you haven't read the book. You haven't watched the trailer. You haven't actually done your homework to be able to come I mean, so and criticize. But yes, you're so vocal. So for me, haters, it really is just a case of, you know what, just be happy in your life mm. and leave me to do what I'm doing because at the end of the day, I answer only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when someone is happy in their life, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> like, <laughs> are you looking at someone else's lane saying, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, you're, you're, you're doing your thing. Yeah. You're yeah. preoccupied. You're too busy, too yeah. focused. Yeah. But it's when you are still and you are hating on the fact that you are still. That's it. That's yeah. when you can look at everyone else who's moving saying that, well, have something to say right I think and I think what I see I don't know if you if you if you all see this as well is that uh, um, we're talking about haters a lot of haters then use Islam to 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 comfort to comfort themselves <laughs> that they're doing the right thing that they are you know trying to forbid wrong that they're trying to uh, keep the ummah intact and it's 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 comforting right and they, they present it to you in that way and of course it's important for us to propagate islam to correct people we should be open to constructive criticism but when a hater is on a mission and it's like you know you're going to the hellfire and you are a destruction you know you're going to you're going to cause destruction in this ummah and you're going you know you're you're, you're doing this and that and, and they 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 cover it with islam I, I wonder if the issues are a lot deeper a lot deeper than just simply i'm not doing anything i'm bored she is i wish i could but i'm not remember that there are a lot of people with emotional and mental issues yeah. that will never acknowledge them because they've they've put on a mask mm. and I see this and we see this happening all the time how many times have you heard of a husband using Islam as a cover for his narcissistic behavior for example mm. or his control you know his controlling behavior mm. uh, or a mother using Islam on her child to cover up her narcissistic behavior yes. or her desire to control or her need to feel significant. Mm -hmm. And so I really think one of the things that the 90s bequeathed to us, <laughs> if I can say it that way, mm -hmm. is the sense of performing as Muslims and the need and desire to be seen to be doing the right thing, right. to have the right look, to have the right kalam, mm -hmm. to, to, to know the right things to say in the right situations in order for you to appear like you are, you are an ideal Muslim or yeah. an ideal Muslimer. Yeah. And maybe also to be accepted. Yes. Well, but that, but you see, that was the price. That was the price that you paid. Mm -hmm. you, pre, you pay the price, you get into the club. Okay, it's like an admission ticket. Yeah. Look the right way, speak the right words, you'll get into the club and you'll be accepted. But the problem is that nobody was really accepted no. unless they had the appearance that they were supposed to have. But what I'm saying is a lot of us still haven't rectified 
the, the, the pain that we have, that we're still carrying with us, wounds that we still have not, are not healed because we've just slapped a band-aid of Islam on it. Yeah. Right. So, you know, and, and this is something that's, subhanAllah, that's why when people come to Islam and I hear about somebody accepting Islam, I'm very careful and cautious with them. Because what you don't want to do is do what they used to do to us, which is now that you're Muslim, your life is perfect. All your sins are gone. You are all good. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, it's like your life, that's done. Like your previous life, whatever childhood you have, whatever you went through with your teenager or your baby father, whatever, it's all over now because you're Muslim now. Mm-hmm. And now everything's going to be okay because, you know, you have Islam. Mm-hmm. That's not true. It's a completely false image. But with Muslims, I really feel that one of the things that, alhamdulillah, we're kind of breaking through it now, Mm -hmm. but that need to perform Mm -hmm. and that need to see people performing, it makes us feel good. When we see a sister who appears to be doing the right thing, it makes us feel good. And that's why I think this whole thing about, you know, inspirational talks and inspirational khutbahs, not even khutbahs actually, uh, inspirational kind of like memes and inspirational posts on Instagram make people feel good. But actually they hardly ever address any of the underlying issues or call us to actually work on ourselves. And so what I was saying was, Anything that, you know, with regards to kind of jealousy or, or criticism or wanting to control other people's behavior mm-hmm. under the name of Islam, particularly it's coming from a person's own nafs, mm-hmm. their own unhappiness with themselves, their own desire to, to, to escape whatever it is that is, like you said, making them feel like their life is, is, not what, is, is not so amazing that at the end of the day, I've got my own race to run. And this is what I always tell sisters. <laughs> You've got your own race to run. You're in your lane, you're in your lane, you're in yours and I'm in mine. I don't have time to look over at uh, Alia's lane and say, well, how far has she gone? Like, yeah. like how's she running? Or what's her style? No. Or, or the flip side is that you can look over and you can say, you know what? She's running so elegantly. She's running at, you know, at a certain speed. And you know what? She's inspired me. I'd like to catch up with her. I'd like to run with her. Yeah. So I'd like, to, I'd like to talk about that, running with sisters, mm-hmm. you, know? you know, catching up, wanting to catch up, not because you want to tear surpass them down or surpass yeah. her, but you really want to just, you know, you want to race towards good and achievement and success and, and towards Allah together. And, and how powerful that is um, and what our experiences have been in regards to, you know, in, in regards to that. I think in the Muslim community, I think a lot of people feel like they have to do it alone because they're scared of jealousy, mm-hmm. right? And they're scared of the backlash and talk and stuff. I mean, if you had allowed the thoughts of that to come into your into play for you at that time, you wouldn't have really had from my sister's lips released because there was so much that came with that, right? Mm -hmm. But to, you know, just to kind of think there are people and to know that there are people who will be in my lane, who will who will be my supporters, be and and my cheerleaders. And there will be times that I'm slipping, and they will be people who say, "Keep going, mm-hmm. don't give up." And there are people like that who will be like, Come, yeah. what, "What were you doing?" And I, think it's, I, I think it's really really important for us as women to share the ups and downs of our journeys. Yes. Yeah. Because if we really want to raise women up, it's not just simply saying, you can do it, you've got it, it's gonna happen. No, because that wasn't the case for us. We, it was hard work, you know, we were exhausted, we sacrificed. And it's important for us to, to I think part of raising women up and wanting for, for other women, what we, what we have experienced for ourselves is to share the entire experience yeah. and to allow that to be a learning curve for others. That's one of the things that I am just so loving about. Sorry, and the thing is, you know me, I believe everything is available, right? <laughs> so the online space is toxic, but the online space is also beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And it really depends on what you focus on because yes. I think one of the gifts that the online space has given us. Yes, I'm gonna say it, (laughs) okay? So one of the gifts that social media has given us, especially now, our generation, is the ability to be real and transparent. And it's not just a few, it's it's a trend, it's a thing, you know, where Muslim women are, are, and and to a certain extent, brothers, but they still need to catch up. Um, (laughs) But Muslim women are not feeling the need to perform as much as we did 10, 15, 20 years ago. 
And now on a public platform, when somebody that you admire, and it, it happens all the time, because obviously we live in an age of like overexposure, right? Yeah. So I think we've probably taken our cues from influencers out there who are being very raw and very honest. Mm -hmm. But in our community, what that means is that sisters know they're not alone. It almost gives them permission exactly. as well yeah, to be, yeah. to be open and vulnerable yeah. and to, to take off the mask. Yeah. Um, and to live the human experience yeah, and to be human and to, uh, to, to be exactly it's, mm. it's like to allow to have that mercy with yourself that rahma with yourself mm. because that's what was missing before mm. I mean we've got a ton of things missing now but that's fine yeah, yeah. 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 we're moving it's, it, it's dunya it's dunya exactly it's never going to be perfect and we're never going to be a perfect ummah none of us are ever going to be perfect but it's it's that having mercy with yourself and, and, and allowing yourself, like you said, to kind of, to be human and to accept what that means and still be hopeful of Allah's mercy. Mm -hmm. I think for me, that is, that is the difference because before, if you acknowledge that you were weak, you believe Allah was, was punishing you. Mm -hmm. You know, you believe that, you know, you were, you were like not as good as everyone else. Mm -hmm. You're the one with the problem. Mm -hmm. You've got low Iman. That's why this, that, this, that, this, that. Mm -hmm. And really, it was a case of really despairing of Allah's mercy. Whereas exactly. Deficiency in your Islam. Exactly, exactly. Because that's how it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was put out. But I think now sisters know, alhamdulillah, that Allah created us as he did for a reason. Mm -hmm. Allah created us to fall, but yet to rise again. Mm -hmm. Allah created us to hurt and to mourn, but then also to rejoice and to mm -hmm. celebrate. And that beautiful like symphony of just the yin and the yang, the good and the bad, the black and white, and, and that whole, the holistic experience. Mm. I think we are living it now. Mm. And it gives us permission to breathe. But I, inshallah, I pray it also gives our children permission to breathe. Mm. Because that- They're seeing it. They're seeing it. I think also like uh, what I hear you guys saying is kind of like we're reconstructing the village again. Yeah. We're creating the sense of support. And I think we're, we're, we're specifically talking about the achievement and the people who are out in the public sphere. But even for the people who are talking about just being at home with their kids or being a mom or homeschooling or whatever it is, just having your people who are in your corner who are supporting you like I'll take the kids, mm. go out with hubby. Yeah. We're just yeah. there. We're in each other's corner truly. And it's not about, OK, She's got it all together and she, you know, doesn't need any help and she's the ideal mom. If I appear to be any less or I need help, then something's lacking or I'm behind. But it's okay to say I'm struggling. Can somebody step in mm -hmm. and support me? And I think just in the openness, but also being with each other. Mm -hmm. Like actually I, I really I really love that building of the I love that. That's that and that's that is what sisterhood is. Mm -hmm. It's come it's the coming together, it's the 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 supporting it's, you know, when, when one sister is down, a group of sisters lifts her up and, and says, you know, okay, we're gonna carry you. We're gonna carry you through this until you can carry yourself, mm -hmm. right? And um, uh, I think we, we, we're we moving towards that. Mm -hmm. It's coming back, yeah. right? I think it's so interesting that, you know, we first started talking about sort of the backlash mm -hmm. towards from my sister's lips, but as I said, everything is available. Mm -hmm. So while there were sisters who were made uncomfortable by that and didn't get it behind it, literally, thousands did get behind it yeah. and in fact the book itself is called a celebration of of muslim womanhood yeah. because that's what it was mm -hmm. uh, and and it's and that's what it still is and in fact a funny story i had finished the book on the chapter on knowledge mm -hmm. and my dad was one of my beta readers and he read it through and he said why did you end it on knowledge it's a bit dry I think you should end it on sisterhood. And I was like, why? Because if some of you've read it, you remember the bit on sisterhood was very celebratory and everything. And I said, why? He said, because the one thing the feminists want is sisterhood, is unity amongst women. That's what feminists want. Right. And you guys have it. Mm. We work. <laughs> and he was like, that should be the crowning achievement, that should be the way you wrap it up, is the celebration of this bond that you have, that people don't expect you to have because you're segregated or you're covered or, you know, all of that stuff. But actually the segregation makes us stronger. I believe that. I believe the fact that we are not competing with each other, the fact that we, you know, like aren't up in each other's, you know, husband's faces, or the fact that we don't have male energy in our surroundings most of the time, 
enables us to create something really powerful. You know what it's like. Mm. You know, remember we've had events where it's like 400 women in a hall. That energy it's is right. powerful. Yeah. And that's all us. Mm. No need for gatekeepers. No need for people to speak for us. No need to feel like if you say something, he's gonna, you know, men are going to perceive it this way or that way. N none of that. Like no barriers. And that for me is, for me, subhanAllah, like as a revert, that is the most precious thing that I feel, aside from Iman, that I have gained from the deen, is that freedom and that, that beautiful heart-centered sharing with other women and connecting with them. Sometimes you never see them again. Yeah. But in that moment, you were connected. There's just this synergy there. Then there's this amazingly life-giving energy. And that's why I'm always saying to you, like, we need more. We need more and we need to bring our daughters in and we need to keep cultivating this energy because women's, women's energy is powerful. When they, especially when they come together. Yeah. That's when it's powerful. I mean, there's no point you on your own in your kitchen. Like, there's no other. <laughs> a woman on her own is, is a force. Is a force. a force. But when, when you when bring you women together, together, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. And I love, and I love what, you, what you were saying about bringing our daughters and that's something that we personally yes. do together in terms of bringing our daughters in because they get to see that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they get to, to experience yeah. that and then they get the opportunity to start creating that for themselves yes. too. And, you know, the, seeing them, not just their mums achieving, but their mums achieving together, together yes, yes. is like, okay, where, where's my crew? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is this has been a very interesting, I think, I feel like we could have an, easily have a part two, three, four. Um, <laughs> final thoughts from each of us on this topic. So I'll start with you, Sunaya. Um, uh, Find your people, mm. even if it takes a long time, hold out for them because they're there. Yeah. yeah. And, and just to mirror that, your people might not be in, in the same city, in the same town. Mm. The internet is a wide, wide space and you will have, you, you can find your tribe online. Yeah. Naima? I just, I love sisters. <laughs> I do, I just, I just love sisters. I just think from the powerful, strong, articulate, confident ones to the ones who are struggling and kind of trying to make sense of everything, I just have so much love for my sisters in Islam. And I just pray that Allah lifts us all up because I believe that there is enough food on the table for everyone Absolutely. and that we are stronger together. Yes. And I think that this space is an amazing testament to that. And I so. love that Sisters Magazine was that. Like yeah. it embodied that, like we are stronger yeah. together, and yeah, that yes. was always part of the ethos. And yeah. may Allah reward you. I mean, all the sisters who were involved, I who mean, made it what it was, alhamdulillah. I, mean. I think my final uh, thoughts on this is that practically, when you go out into the world and you encounter another sister, be it on a one to one level or in a group, that you just ask yourself one simple question, and that is, how can I empower this other sister today? How can I make her feel better about herself? How can I make her feel stronger? How can I interact with her in a way that makes her leave our interaction thinking, you know what, I'm gonna become better, I'm gonna do better, I'm gonna bring it. So that's, that's my kind of final piece. This has been an interesting topic. We want the sisters to come together and flood the comments. <laughs> we want the sisters to come together and flood the comments. We want to build that village, as Sumeya said, mashallah. Mm -hmm. We look forward to reading what you have to say, and we'll speak to you again at the next episode of Honesty Talk, inshallah. Jazakallah khair to Naima for engaging with us and um, bringing the sisterhood to the table, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. You're not receptive at the beginning. You, you're not trying to hear advice. Sometimes you need to you need to hurt and process. Every single person, scholar, layman, man, woman, rich, poor, is tested with something. But when you're in the storm, when you're in the eye of the storm, that experience, it's different for every person. So you need a safe space to express yourself without being judged or bombarded or told what to do. You just need someone to carry you. But it is also an invitation. You know, a test is an invitation to draw close to Allah.
Thank you.